get there to 1 Thessalonians 5, you stand with me. Let's pray again. This will be the third time we pray. And uh, in this meeting, and uh, let's pray and ask God to help us to understand and to obey these truths. Amen. Let's do that together. Father, I am truly thankful for your inspired and infallible word. I'm so glad that we're not gathered together this morning trying to find the truth, trying to locate it in some philosophy, in some denomination. But God, I'm glad that we have your inspired and infallible truth in our hands. And God, I pray as we take in these few verses, these three verses this morning, Father, I pray they would change the very course of our actions as individuals and as a church. And Father, I pray they would evermore honor you. And we would honor you by obeying them. Father, I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You be seated. Let's get right to it. Last Sunday morning, we, start, we studied verses 14 uh, through 15 under the heading of what are the spiritually strong to do? Well, this morning we are going to look at verses 16, 17, and 18 under the same heading. Someone has given a very accurate description, a very short description of the verses that you and I are studying this morning. And here's what this person said. Uh, not only about verse 16, 17, and 18, but also about verses uh, 16 through 22. That's how they, but this is the summary this person writes about verses 16 through 22. This person says the next set of verses features clear commands, mostly short and to the point. And boy, are they. You wanna, we are, many people uh, memorize verses, uh, you know, like for Bible school, you know, it's kind of a, a funny thing some people do. They'll under, they'll memorize Jesus wept, you know, and things like that. But I'll tell you what, you want some powerful verses, which that is a powerful verse that Jesus wept. You want some powerful verses that are short? We're going to be looking at them uh, the next couple of weeks, 16 through 22. They are short. They are powerful, powerful verses. And we're going to see that together as we look down through here. But let's look at these verses. And I want you to notice what they are. They're actions that we do. They're commands that we obey. I want us to, to, to take that in. Everybody says, I wish God would do something. He has done something. He's done far more than he ought to have done. But, but here he is calling his church out of what he has done and we have access to, because of what he's done, to do some actions. And every one of these actions that we're going to read are commands to you and I. And I want us to see those together. Look at the first one. What are the spiritually strong to do? The spiritually strong are to always rejoice. Look at verse number 16. Is this a short verse? Rejoice evermore. Is it going to be conquered Without the power of God, no, it will not be. This is, a, this is as supernatural as the salvation that you and I received when we got eternal salvation and had our sins eternally wiped away by trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior. This is as supernatural as that. Rejoice evermore. This is something that the spiritually strong do no matter what. That's why the word evermore is there. The worldliest, the most carnal believer can be quote unquote happy when everything is as they think it should be in their world. Your world, the other person's world doesn't matter because the carnal Christian isn't about the brother or the sister. But as long as it is okay in their world, they're happy. But when problems arise, like the problems in Thessalonica, like some of the problems that we heard of about persecution in the world today this week, 
We heard of a, of a lady who had her arm chopped off because she trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. Her husband did that because she had trusted Jesus Christ. And persecution was here in Thessalonica and so many other things. But the command to rejoice evermore does not change for the believer, will not change for the spiritually strong believer. As a matter of fact, one commentator said this about the word rejoice. And there's so much wrapped up in these words, these verbs, like rejoice. Like I said, it's an action that we do. It's a, it's a command that we obey. But this person says this. It is in the present tense. It's a present tense imperative. And it implies that the rejoicing should be ongoing, an ongoing attitude and action on the part of the Thessalonians. It's present tense. When it was written, rejoice evermore. He didn't say you used to rejoice. He didn't say you're going to rejoice. What does he say? He says rejoice evermore. It is supernatural. I, I don't want, and I keep saying it's supernatural because I do not want Satan coming to you and saying you'll never be that. Because it is true if we are t looking to ourselves for it looking to something we're doing or some promises that I've made to do it, we're looking somewhere well beyond that for the, these promises and for these actions to be fulfilled in our lives. And it's supernatural. I want to give you an example of this rejoicing evermore. I hope you'll turn your Bible there to Acts chapter number 5. And I want you to see it in, your, in the Bible. I want to give you an example of spiritually strong believers Rejoicing from the book of Acts chapter number 5. Rejoicing evermore. If you all probably remember what's going on in, in Acts chapter number 5. The apostles of Christ are being uh, persecuted. And they're being persecuted and they're wanting to stop the spread of the message of Jesus Christ. That's what, they're, that's what those who are persecuting them are wanting to do. They don't want them to speak in the name of Jesus Christ anymore. And there's a, very, uh, there's a man who rises up who's a teacher of the law. His name is Gamaliel. And he tells those folks who are persecuting those apostles, if there's nothing to it, basically, he says he'll stop. He says, if this is just something these men have come up with, these apostles, it will go away. But he says, if it is of God, you know, basically, what are you going to do about it if it's of God? That's right. He says that basically in verses 38 and 39. But I want us to pick up in verse number 40 You see what's going on in this chapter. Now listen to what it says. Verse 40 of Acts chapter 5. And to him, Gamaliel, who was that teacher of the law, they, the Sadducees, agreed. They agreed with what he said in verses 38 and 39. And when they had called the apostles, notice what it says, and beaten them. And beaten them. They didn't say something bad about them on Facebook. They didn't hurt their feelings. They beat them. And then what did they do? Look after the comma. It says they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Verse 41. And they, speaking about the, the apostles, departed from the presence of the council. You ought to underline that very next word in your Bible. Rejoicing. And they departed from the presence of this uh, council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for Jesus' name, for his name, it says. Do you think they stopped? No way. They couldn't stop. Look at verse 42. They wanted them to stop talking about Jesus, but in verse 42, and daily in the temple and every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. This person who brought them joy, the Lord Jesus, the truth about Christ that brought them this joy, they could not keep from rejoicing and they could not keep from telling about the one who brought them this rejoicing 
And it is the person, the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Just, just about anyone you talk to today, just about anyone you talk to today is, uh, is dealing with discouragement. They're dealing with discouragement over something that is going on in, in their life. Or they're dealing with discouragement when they see the track of this world. And I, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about concerns. Concerns and discouragement aren't the same things. We talked about concerns last week. And the spiritually strong, they have concerns. They're concerned for the souls of other people. They're concerned for their spiritual growth and the spiritual growth of others. They're, they're, they're concerned about the health of the local New Testament Bible-believing church. I'm not talking about concerns. I'm talking about discouragement. Um, I'm not talking about sorrow. Those are, those are different things. Discouragement might become a cause of sorrow, but sorrow... Um, sorrow will heal to some extent but discouragement will last for some time and I'm going to tell you how long it will in just a moment but even in the midst of sorrow the Bible instructs us to rejoice in 2 Corinthians 16 it says this he says as sorrowful yet always rejoicing Paul says I'm talking about discouragement not sorrow and not concern. I'm talking about discouragement. And let, let me tell you why these apostles in the book of Acts were not discouraged over what just happened to them. Their beating. Two words. Their focus. Their focus. Most professing Christians today are focused on this world and the things of God they rarely ponder. The promises of God. The love letter that God has written to them, they rarely ponder. The instructions that he's given us, they rarely ponder. But this world has taken their minds. The concerns of this life have taken their minds. But even in all of this, I think we can say this. We need to get our focus right. Let me tell you some verses that help, helps me to do that. And they're found in the book of Philippians, chapter number four. And you can turn there if you'd like to, but I'm going to start reading in just a moment in verse number four of Philippians, chapter number four. If you don't want to turn there, just jot that down and you can read it later. But their focus made the difference. Their focus made the difference. Listen to what he says in Philippians four, four through nine, as Paul writes. <laughs> Notice the first word, rejoice. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation or your gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. He's near. Who wouldn't that make rejoice? For those who really know who he is. Who really know what the, the scriptures say his character is. Who he is in, in, as, as our God who loves us who provides for us his sovereignty, his great authority over everything. But he's near, he says. But look at verse 6. He says, be careful for nothing or anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. And listen to this. You want to, you want the prescription to get rid of the pandemic blues, Paul has given it to us. And it doesn't focus on the news. I bet many people as that profess to know Christ and say they're believers have, have looked at the news more than their Bibles this week. They've talked to the neighbor on the phone about what they saw in the news more than they've talked to God in prayer. And I'll tell you what it's showing on them. They're struggling. But I'll tell you what, he's given us the prescription for it. Look at what he says. And verse 7, in the peace of God, he's the source, and this is his peace, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through, and here comes God's channel for that peace, Jesus Christ. Verse 8, he said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, he's going to tell us what to think about. 
Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are a good report, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Giving us a prescription to have rejoicing in our lives. How long will we be robbed of our rejoicing as professing believers? As long as we have our focus off of Jesus Christ. That's right. And what we have made <coughs> and what we have been made in him. Listen, how can I rejoice in the person I've not come to know? Or know what he's done for me. How can I rejoice in him? And the only way to know those things is the word of God. And then what do we do? We do those actions that he has commanded us to do. We, meet, we have to change our focus. Did you know rejoicing and joy in the life of the believer is a supernatural thing? We read this verse last week, but it's out of Galatians 5, 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. And then he goes out through there and names the rest of those. Look at the next thing. Look at the next verse, verse 17 in 1 Thessalonians 5. The spiritually strong always rejoice. It's supernatural. But it is an action on our part as we pursue it as a command of God. We're always trying to see what is keeping me from that. And, and the majority of the time, it will be what my focus is on. Mm -hmm. Look at the next thing. The spiritually strong pray continually. Verse 17 says this. It says pray continually. Pray, what do we know it as? Without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. When Christians are down and out, and we talked about what, what we ought to be doing, rejoicing evermore. But when Christians are down and out, they're up and out of their prayer closets. You tell me a person in this room that runs to the prayer closet when they're discouraged. That's, that's normally not the case. We run to the refrigerator, is that not true? Yeah. And eat my feelings. Eat my discouragement. We run somewhere else, but we run out of our prayer closets. We might be down and out, distressed, depressed, or whatever, but, we, and we're, but we're up and out of our prayer closets because of that. But I want you to remember, this is a command, a commanded action to the believer to not do this. Is disobedience. Is sin. Look what he says. He says, pray. What is prayer? Somebody says this way. One writer says that prayer is simply to speak to God. And you know there's professing believers that haven't spoken to God all week long. If, if he was like an, any regular person, a, a person of your family that you haven't talked to all week, they think he's mad at him. Mm -hmm. That's right. But all week long, hadn't called out and spoken to the one who invites us to his throne of grace. Today is the day to make that right. Amen. To change the prayer life, our prayer lives. Let, I want to read you a uh, the words of a hymn that puts to music what prayer is. Here's the, here's the title of it. It was written in 1818. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire is the name of the song, the hymn. And, and here's how it goes. He says, prayer is the soul's sincere desire uttered or unexpressed. You know what he means? I might have verbally said it or I might just said it to myself in my own mind. He said the motion, in other words, it's an action. The motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. I think that is the problem with prayer today. There's no fire. Mm. 
The fire went out. Politics put it out. Facebook put it out. Family problems put it out. The fire that is only kindled by God and brings about prayer in the life of the believer. Stanza 2 goes, Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infants' lips can try. Prayer is the sublimest strains that reach the majesty on high. Listen to this, I love this. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air. You know, there's nothing strange about a Christian praying. Even if you're sitting somewhere eating and you bow to prayer, what is that? It is our native air. Mm. Like this songwriter says. He says his, his watchword, the believer's watchword at the gates of death, he enters heavens with prayer. Listen to this when we sin though. He said prayer is the contrite sinner's voice returning from his ways with angels in their songs rejoice and cry, behold, he prays. Pray, pray. And what is the motion of our prayer? How often do we do it? If we do it 30 minutes a day, we've somehow done God a favor. But that's not what the verse says, is it? It says pray without ceasing. Amen. They said Charles Spurgeon was a man who was constant, had a prayer on his lips as he made his way through his day. Doesn't mean he didn't have a prayer closet. Doesn't, and, and what I mean by that is he didn't have a time when he was praying during the day. But he just went through his day praying for the things that he saw and the things that he was doing. But what does it mean to pray without ceasing? What does it mean? Here's what one writer wrote. They said such prayer as prayer without ceasing, as Paul envisions, this person says, involves an unbroken fellowship with God that can and will go to Him at a moment's notice. I love this part right here. It will go to God at a, mo at a moment's notice due to need or love. Do you ever just go to God in prayer for, for love? You just say, I love Him. It's not a question whether he loves me. He has made that abundantly clear. Sometimes you just go to him and you don't have a need that you're going to express. I'm not saying you shouldn't. He wants us to. But you just go to him because you love him. Because you've looked in this book and this book has gotten your soul and you want to talk to him Amen. and say, I love you. I love you. I love you. Walk to your wife and say, I love you. Why? Why are you saying that? Gosh, I hope she doesn't say that when I just walk by and say, I love you. Just to go to God and say, I love you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. I love you. We still, we still have our midweek prayer service here at the church. And you know, it's the least attended service Amen. of the week. That's right. And I'll tell you this, Preach you down. I understand. Some can't make it, but I realize that most don't want to make it. I, I do. I realize that. But I want to read you an article that Charles Spurgeon wrote. He wrote this article in 1887. He wrote it for The Sword and the Trial, which was a publication that he made. And the title of it is The Case Proved. And I read the article, and in that article, Spurgeon speaks about how the prayer meeting is a measuring stick for the spirituality of the local church. Here's what he says, and I quote. He said, we are not yet alone in the opinion that our meetings for prayer are very excellent thermometers of the spiritual condition of our people. You want to see what a church is like? People say, well, I go there on Sunday morning, it's packed. You want to see what a church is like? Go there when it's not Sunday morning. Right. Amen. You want to see what that church is about? Go there on Sunday morning. You want to see what the spirituality is like in that church? Go there when they're having a prayer meeting. Amen. You want to see what that church is like? Go there when they're going soul winning. Right. Amen. And you see the three or four people that came out for it. Go to that church when they're saying, all we're going to do is meet and pray. And you hear the echoes through the church. You say, Sam, that just sounds so legalistic to me. No, 
I love him. And I thank God for the church. Amen. And I want to pray with my brothers and sisters for the needs they have. That's right. And for spiritual needs and physical needs that they have. You see the meetings of the church. They're getting less and less and less attended. True, true, true. I talked to a gentleman on the phone this week. He said, I am an assistant pastor, I think he said, in a virtual church. He called me, wanted to talk to me. He said, I am the assistant pastor, I think is the word he used, some, some kind of leader in it, in a virtual church. Do you know what he was calling me about? Need to rent money. I said, there's no such thing as a virtual church. I said, there is. When you read the New Testament, you read about a local New Testament yes. church that met in the flesh, pastor-led, deacon-served church. Yes. And I said, if you had that, you wouldn't be on the phone with me right now. That's right. I gave him all the help I could. But if he'll take that advice that I gave him, <laughs> that'll be the best help he'll ever get. Because that rent will come due again. But we helped him all we could. When people are looking at YouTube and saying, this is my church, that is completely unbiblical. I'm grateful that we can post on there for now. I'm grateful that we can put them on the website so people who cannot come can hear it. But I want to tell you, you think, I'm going to start having a virtual church. I'm going to start doing that. It's going, it's going to get popular. It's going to explode because of what we're going through right now in the church. But I want to tell you this. This will never change what God has instructed the church to do. Amen. A local New Testament church that's praying without ceasing, that's rejoicing evermore, that's meeting for growth, for holiness, for baptisms, for all of these types of things, for, for all these things, for fellowship. Hey, don't forget the fellowship. Amen. Good preaching. But when you get to prayer, listen, if you say, I'm going to have a dinner, you know, you're going to have a crowd, friend. I had a, I had a preacher tell me a while back, he said, we had, we had a dinner for the community. It's packed. I said, oh, really? I couldn't believe that. It's been a while back, obviously. I'll tell you what, but you have a prayer meeting. You'll see the strength of that church. Mm -hmm. That's right. You'll see the strength of the spirituality of those who attend that church. Amen. When we're meeting for prayer, we're meeting for prayer is to pray without ceasing. Let me, let me summarize verses 16 and 17, then let's move on. In verses, in verses 16 and 17, Paul commands us to rejoice in verse 16. In verse 17, he commands us to pray. And here's what somebody said. And both of these are to be done with, open quote, Ongoing vigilance, close, close quote. This leads me to ask the question, what happens in the prayer to prayer in the life of the believer when rejoicing is absent? When you and I struggle with our rejoicing, we will also struggle with our prayer lives. I say that to say this because it's almost repeating what I just said. These two verses must be tethered together. Let's tie another one to them. Look at verse 18. What are the spiritually strong to do, whether to rejoice evermore, they to pray without ceasing? Now let's look at verse 18. The spiritually, spiritually strong are to always be thankful. Verse 18. In verse 18 it says, In everything give thanks. Listen to this. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You say, I don't know what the will of God is for me. Read the scriptures. That's right. It is abundantly clear. Abundantly clear. Now, I know what some people mean when they say that. They say, they're talking specifically as far as should I go do this or should I go do that? Should I teach this or that? I'll tell you this. You get concerned about this will and that one will be abundantly clear. It really will. I don't say that just from hoping so, but from knowing so. And I, 
I don't want that to sound high. Or my, it, it is not meant to be that at all. You know me. You've been around me. You've seen me warts and all. But I want to tell you something. For this is the will of God. Paul has already said this is the will of God concerning you. He talked When he talked about holiness in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He talks about it being the will of God. But he says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What does it mean to be thankful in everything? Does it mean that I should be thankful for sins and disasters in my life? Well, I don't believe so. But do you know what? But because we are in Christ Jesus, we are able to be thankful for God, to God, for the forgiveness of those sins. Because God takes those disasters that he sends our way and allows our way to grow us. And we can be thankful even in them. That's right. The sins and the disasters, we can look at and say, I'm thankful not for the disaster itself, certainly not for the sin itself, but for what Christ did in it and through it and for it. That's right. What a wonderful Savior we have. Amen. Listen to this. I got two quotes I want you to hear. Here's one of them. Paul never instructed the church to thank God for evil events, but to thank God that even in evil times and circumstances, our hope remains. And God continues to work in our lives. Here's the second quote. True, this person says, we do not thank God for bad events narrowly viewed in and of themselves. That's the problem right there. When the events happen, they're narrowly viewed. They're not viewed as Joseph viewed them. And we'll see more about Joseph in our sometime. True, we do not, this person says, we do not thank God for bad events narrowly viewed in and of themselves, but we should thank Him for such events as they are viewed in the wide angle lens as part of His plan to sanctify us and to glorify Himself. Do you know who is always thankful. The Spirit-filled believer. Right. Adrian Rogers, he said, us Christians are grumbly hateful instead of humbly grumble. Yeah. 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 You say, I'm a spiritual person. <laughs> they said, I understand these things will overtake us. But if we get back to that spirit-filled point, Thanksgiving will have to be back in our lives. You say, how do you know that? Listen to what the Word of God says. You can write this in your margin, but it's Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. And the spirit-filled believer is thankful. Listen to this. He says, and be not drunk with wine where it is excess. That's how America is dealing with what's going on. You knew that, right? I think I told you this. I heard one preacher say that he can't find his favorite soda pop because they've used the loon in the packed beer. But here's what he says. Be not drunk with wine where there's excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always. For all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You catch a person, they shouldn't catch us being thankful. It ought to be who we are. That's right. That's who we've been made in Christ. I want to close it. And I want to read to you as I close this what someone said about the three commands that we just looked at about rejoicing evermore, praying without ceasing, being thankful and everything. I want, to, want you to hear if someone makes a quote about those. Here it is. He says, finally, in all three of the commands, the apostle calls for an ongoing vigilance. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. I mean, seriously, do any of us have the victory in that? <laughs> you know, uh, this ongoing vigilance. All three of these actions, this person says, rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks are to be part of the characteristic practice of the believers that help them to rise above the potentially discouraging circumstances of life that emerge in a fallen world. That's the end of the quote. 
If you and I tether these three things together, and we're going to add to them next time we meet, next Sunday, if we tether these commands together, we will not be like the world. That's right. If we tether these three things together, we will not be like the carnal believer. It will absolutely be impossible. There will be just something automatically different about you and your walk with Christ when you tether these things together as a part of the actions you're doing and the commands you're obeying. You're here this morning. Amanda's going to come and she's going to play. You're here. I mean, what am I supposed to say? That I've conquered these three things and it's always... Well, you know that wouldn't be right. Amanda would surely know that isn't right. Mays would know that isn't right. But what keeps us from pressing forward to obey it and to be like these things? Can I tell you what? No. Not when you're Christ. It's to get our focus right. Get our priorities right. You say, I'm here and I don't even know Christ. That's where you must start. Mm -hmm. You will never have rejoicing evermore. You'll never be able to pray without ceasing and be thankful in everything until you've trusted Christ as your Savior. Would you trust him today? You say, what did he do for me? He died for your sins. Mm -hmm. There's dirty, black, rotten sins that people are setting aside and saying, that's not important. Oh, they're important. They're against the holy God. He went and sent his son because he loves us to die for those sins, to be buried and to rise again, paid the debt. And then he says to you and I, whoever is lost, he says, believe on him and you'll have everlasting life. Life. Trust him. Trust what he did. Trust Christ. And you'll have everlasting life. Listen, you stand with me. You can come and pray up here if you like and pray right where you're at. But I hope that we'll all pray. God bless you.